So utopia for me just means a, a kind of profoundly better future. And I think it's important because I think it's just actually possible. I just think it's actually something that we could do. If, if we sort of play our cards right, we could just build a world that is radically better than the world we live in today. Infinite ethics is ethics that tries to grapple with how we should uh, act with respect to kind of infinite worlds. There's a middle ground between I shall ignore this completely and I shall, you know, be a Jane, um, which is recognizing that this is a this is a real trade-off. There's uncertainty here and and taking responsibility for how you're responding to that. The future is a big thing to try to model with this tiny mind. And so, you know, of necessity, you need to use these extremely lossy abstractions. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Joe Carlsmith, who's a senior research analyst at Open Philanthropy and a doctoral student in philosophy at the University of Oxford. Um, Joe uh, Joe has a really interesting blog that I got to check out uh, called Hands in Cities. Um, And that's the reason that I wanted to have him on the podcast, because it has a bunch of thought provoking an insightful uh, post on there about philosophy, morality, ethics, uh, the future. And yeah, so I, I really wanted to talk to you, Joe, uh, but uh, you, do, do you want to give a, a bit of a longer intro on what you're up to? Sure. So I work at Open Philanthropy on existential risk from artificial intelligence. Um, and so, you know, I think about what's going to happen with AI, how can we make sure it goes well, and in particular, how can we make sure that advanced AI systems are safe? Uh, and then uh, I have a side project, which is this blog uh, where I write about philosophy and, uh, and the future and, and things like that. And that emerges partly from the, um, a sort of my background, which is um, I was, I was before, before getting into, uh, into AI and working at Open, open Philanthropy, I was in uh, academic philosophy. Okay, yeah, that, that's uh, that, that, that's a quite a, quite an ambitious side project. I mean, given the length and the regularity of those posts, it's it's actually quite stunning. Um, do, do you want to talk more about what you're working on at, about AI at uh, at uh, Open Philanthropy? So it's a mix of things. Right now, I'm thinking about AI timelines and what's called takeoff speed, sort of sort of how fast the transition is from pretty impressive AI systems to AI systems that are uh, kind of radically transformative. Um, and I'm trying to use that uh, to provide more perspective on the probability that um, that everything goes terribly wrong. I see. Okay. Um, I, I didn't know. So, what, what are the implications? I suppose it's uh, higher or lower than I would expect. Um, I guess if it's higher, maybe I should work on AI eleven. But other than that, what is what, what are the implications of that, that that figure changing? I think there are a number of implications just from understanding uh, timelines with respect to how you prioritize and what um, you know just to some extent, the sooner something is, then uh, you need to be planning for it coming sooner and, and kind of cutting more corners or, to, you know, um, counting less on having more time. Um, and yeah, I think overall, the higher you think uh, the probability of catastrophe is, the um, the easier it is for this to uh, to become kind of the most important priority. Uh, I do think there is a range of probabilities where it maybe doesn't matter that much, um, but I think uh, the difference between, say, uh, one and ten percent, I think, is uh, is quite substantive, and um, <laughs> the difference between ten and ninety is quite substantive. And, and um, uh, you know, I know people in all of those ranges. Gotcha. Okay, interesting. Um, yeah. So let's let's back up here and uh, talk a bit more about the philosophy motivating this. So I think you identify as a, a long termist. Um, yeah. So maybe, maybe a broad picture question here is. Um, you have an interesting blog post about what the future looking back on us might think about uh, the 21st century, given the risk we're taking. Um, so, I mean, what, what do you think about the possibility that we are potentially giving up resources, potentially dedicating, well, I'm not, you're dedicating your career um, to, uh, uh, you know, bu- building a future that, you know, maybe given, you know, g- given the fact that you're alive now, you might find strange or disturbing or disgusting. I mean, um, uh, so if, I guess to add more context to the question, if from a utilitarian perspective, the present is clearly much, much better than the past, but somebody from the past might think, that you know, uh, th- there's a lot of things about the present that are kind of disturbing. I mean, they, they, they might not like the configuration of how maybe isolating a, a, a modern city might be. They might find the kinds of free to cheap information that you can access on your phone uh, k- 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 kind of disturbing. Yeah. So, h- h- how do you think about that? So, yeah, a few comments there. So, one, um, I do think that if you 
took, you know, for most people throughout history, if you brought them to the present day, uh, they would, my, my guess is that fairly quickly, and depending on exactly the circumstances, they would um, come to prefer living, uh, living in the present day to, to the past, even if there are sort of a bit of uh, future shock and, and a bit of um, uh, some things are alienating or disturbing. Um, and, but that said, I think the distance, the sort of gap between historical humans and the present is actually much, much smaller. Um, both in terms of time and kind of um, other factors than the gap I envision between present day humans and the future humans who are living living ide ideally in, in um, a kind of radically better situation. Um, and so I do expect sort, sort of greater distance and possibly greater alienation when you first show up. My personal view is that uh, the, best, the best futures are um, uh, going to be such that if you really understood them, and if you really experience what they're like, which, which may be um, a big step and might require sort of extensive uh, engagement and possibly sort of um, changes to your capacities to understand and experience, then you would think it's really good. Um, and so, uh, and, and I think that's the relevant standard. So for me, I, I worry less if the future is sort of initially alienating. Um, and the question for me is how do I feel once I've really, um, really understood what's going on? I see. Um, so I, I, I wonder how much we should value that kind of inside view you would get into the future from being there. If you think about, um, I don't know, many, many existing ideologies, uh, like, I, I don't know, think of an Islamist or something is who might say, listen, if you, if you could just like come to Iraq and feel the bliss of uh, uh, fighting for the caliphate, uh, you, you would understand better than you can understand from the outside view, just, you know, sitting on a couch, eating Doritos, what, what, you know, what it's like to fight for a cause. And may, maybe that their experience is kind of blissful in some kind of way, but um, I, I, I feel like the outside view is more useful than the inside view there. Well, so I think there's a couple different questions there. One is, what would the experience be if you had it from the inside? Um, and then there was, a, I think, a subtly different question, which was, what, which is, what would your take on this be if you kind of fully understood? Where fully understanding is not just um, a matter of having the internal experience of being in, you know, in a certain situation, but it's also a matter of understanding what that situation is causing, what sort of beliefs are structuring um, the ideology, whether those beliefs are true, um, and all sorts of other factors. And it's the latter thing that I have in mind. So I'm not just imagining, oh, the future will feel good if you're there, um, uh, because you know, sort of by hypothesis, the people who are there, at least one hopes they're enjoying it, or one hopes they're thumbs up. If, if the people who are there aren't thumbs up, that's a strange, a strange utopia. Um, but I'm thinking more that in addition to uh, their perspective, there's a sort of more holistic perspective, which is the sort of full understanding. Uh, and that's the perspective from which you would endorse uh, endorse this situation. I see. Um, and then, yeah, so an another respect in which uh, it's interesting to think about what they might think of us is, you know, like, well, what would they think of the crazy risk we're taking um, by not, not optimizing for existential risks? And um, I, so, you, you know, one analogy you could offer, I think Will McCaskill does this in his new book, is to think of us as, uh, you know, teenagers in our civilization's history. And then, you know, think of the crazy things you did as a teenager and how, you, you, um, and yeah, so, uh, I mean, maybe there is an aspect to which, like, one would wish they could take back the crazy things they did as a teenager. But my impression is that most adults probably think that while the crazy things were, um, kind of risky um they were they're very formative and important and um they feel nostalgic nostalgic about the things they did in the past do, do you think that the, the future looking back they are going to um regret the the, the way we we're living the 21st century or uh or will they look back and think oh you know that, that that was kind of a cool time i mean i guess this is kind of conditional on there being a future which takes away a lot of the mystery here but i doubt that they will look back with um uh, with pleasure at uh, the sort of risks and uh, and horrors of the of the 21st century. I mean, if you just think about how uh, we, or at least I, tend to think about uh, something like the Cuban Missile Crisis or uh, World War II, I don't <laughs> personally have a kind of nostalgia. Oh, you know, sure it was risky, but it made it made me who I am, or something like that. Um, I also want to say, you know, I think it's true that when you look back on your teenage years, there is often a sort of, you know, let's say you were, you did some like crazy, you, you and your friends used to race, you know, around and you play chicken or something at the local quarry. Uh, and it's like, oh, right, right, right. but, you know, you survived, right? And, and the real reason not to do that is the like chunk of probability where you just died. Um, and so I think there's a, uh, you know, to some extent, the it's, it's, 
um, the ex post perspective of looking back on certain sorts of risks is not the right one, uh, for, especially for death risks. That's not the right uh, perspective to use to kind of calibrate your understanding of how to feel about it overall. I see. Um, okay, so I think you brought up Utopia, and you have a really interesting post about uh, the concept of Utopia. Uh, so yeah, do you want to talk a little bit more about this concept and why it's important? And, um, and also, why, why do we have so much trouble thinking of a compelling Utopia? Yeah, so Utopia for me just means a, a kind of profoundly better future. And I think it's important because I think it's just actually possible. I just think it's actually something that we could do. Uh, we, we could make, if, if we sort of play our cards right in, in sort of non-crazy ways, we could just build a world that is radically better than the world we live in today. Um, and in particular, I think uh, we often in thinking about um, that sort of possibility underestimate just how big the difference in value could be between um, our current situation and, and kind of um, what's available. Uh, and I think often utopias are kind of anchored too hard on the status quo and sort of changing it in, in small ways, but imagine imagining our kind of fundamental situation basically unaltered. Um, and I think so it's such that it's a little bit like the difference between, you know, you have a kind of a crappy job or like a beach vacation and utopia is like everyone has beach vacation um, and you know i don't know how you feel about beach vacations um but i think it's much i think the difference is more like being asleep and being awake uh or sort of uh it's it's more um uh yeah it's sort of it's like living in a cave or living living in the in under the open sky i think i think it's like a really big a really big difference and um and that that matters a lot I, that's interesting because I remember in the essay you had um, you had a section where um, I, I, uh, you mentioned that you expect utopia to be recognizable, uh, like to, to a person alive now. Um, the, 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 I guess the way you put it just earlier made it seem like it would be a completely different category of experience than we would be familiar with. Um, yeah, yeah. So is there a contradiction there, or maybe I'm missing something? So I think there's at least a tension, and and the way I see the tension. Uh, playing out or, you know, kind of being reconciled is specifically uh, via the notion I referenced earlier of kind of you would, if you truly understood, come to see uh, the utopia as genuinely good. But I think that process, I mean, ideally, I think the way we end up building utopia is we go through a long, um, patient process of becoming wiser and better and more capable as a species. Um, and, and it's in virtue of that process kind of culminating that we're in a position to build, um, to build a civilization that is sort of profoundly good and radically, radically different. Um, but that's a long process. And so I, I do think, you know, if, as I say, if I just transported you right there and you skipped, you skipped the process, then you might not like it. Um, but, uh, and 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 it is quite alien in some sense, but I still. But if you went through the process of like really understanding and kind of becoming wiser, um, uh, you would you would endorse. Uh huh. That's um that's interesting to me that you think uh, the process to get to Utopia is more of a sort of uh, maybe I'm uh, misconstruing it, but when you mentioned it's a process of us getting wiser, and um, um yeah, so it, it sounds like it's a more philosophical process rather than. I don't know, this, uh, we, we figure out how to con convert everything to hedonium and, uh, you know, it's eternal bliss from then on. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, am I getting it right that you think it's more of a philosophical process? And then why is it that you think so? Yeah, so I definitely don't sit around thinking that utopia, we sort of know what utopia is right now, and it's hedonium. Um, I'm not especially into the notion of hedonium, though I think it's possible to um, I think it's, I think the brand is bad. Um, I think, I think, you know, people, uh, talk about pleasure with this kind of dismissive attitude sometimes. And, you know, hedonium implies this kind of sterile, um, uniformity, uh, you, you know, and you're sort of tiling people are talking about, they're like going to tile the universe with hedonium. And it's like, wow, this sounds, this sounds rough. Um, whereas I think actually, you know, the relevant perspective when you're thinking about something like hedonium is the kind of internal perspective from which uh, the sort of experience of the subject is something kind of uh, joyful and, you know, boundless and kind of uh, energizing and, you know, whatever, whatever pleasure is actually like. Pleasure is not a trivial thing. I think pleasure is a, a profound thing in a lot of ways. But I really don't, 
I don't assume that that's what utopia is about at all. I think we're at, I think A, my, you know, my own values seem to be quite complicated. I don't think I just value pleasure. I value a lot of different things. Um, and more broadly, I have a lot of uncertainty about how, how I will think and feel about things if I were to go through a kind of process of significantly uh, increasing my capacity to understand. Um, I don't, I think sometimes when people imagine that, they imagine, oh, we're going to sit around and do a bunch of philosophy and then we'll have like solved normative ethics and then we'll implement our solution to normative ethics. Um, and that's not what I'm imagining by uh, kind of wisdom. I'm imagining something um, richer and also that involves, uh, importantly, a kind of enhancement to our uh, cognitive capacity. So it's sort of really, you know, I think we have, we have very small, we're really limited in our ability to understand the universe right now. We have kind of, um, and I think there's just a huge amount of uncharted territory in terms of what minds can be and do and see. And so I want to sort of chart that territory before we start um, making kind of big and irreversible decisions about what sort of civilization we want to build in the long term. I see. Um, and then I, uh, another uh, maybe concerning part of uh, the utopia is that um, yeah, as you mentioned in the piece, many ma many of the worst ideologies in history have had uh, elements of utopian thinking in them. Um, to the extent that EA and utilitarianism generally are compatible with utopian thinking, maybe they don't uh, advocate utopian thinking, but they are compatible with it. Um, do, do you see that as a problem for uh, the movement's health and potential impact? Is the question something like, uh, is this a red flag? <laughs> kind of, ah, uh, you know, we, we look at we look at other ideologies throughout history, and they've been uh, compatible with utopian thinking, um, and and maybe sort of um, effective altruism or, or, or uh, utilitarianism or something is similarly compatible. So should we should we worry in the same way? Is that the question? Uh, yeah, partly, and also um, another part is um, maybe the maybe maybe it's still right uh, that like morally speaking, yeah, uh, utopia is compatible with this worldview, and the worldview is correct. Uh, but that, that, that the implications uh, are that you know somebody misunderstands what is best, um, they identify as an EA, and this leads to bad consequences when they try to implement their scheme. Yeah, so I think there are certainly reasons to be cautious uh, in this broad vein. Um, I don't see them as very specific to EA or utilitarian. I don't identify as utilitarian, but um, the, to utilitarianism, um, I see them as more or sort of better understood as uh, risks that come from believing that something is very important at all. Um, and I think it's true that many um, acting from a space of, of conviction, um, especially where uh, that conviction has has sort of a flavor of, you know, it's, it's interesting what exactly constitutes an ideology, but I think it's, I think it's reasonable to look at, at EA and sort of be like, this has, this looks like an ideology. And I think, you know, and I think um, that's, I think that's right. And I think uh, that's sort of important to, to, you know, have the sort of relevant red flags about. Um, I think it's pretty hard to have a view of the world that doesn't in some sense imply that it could be a lot better um, or at least a plausible view of the world. And, and when I say utopia, I don't really mean anything much different from that. You know, I think it's sort of, um, I'm not saying a perfect thing. I'm not, you know, I, I do have sort of a more specific view about exactly how much better things could be, but more broadly, it seems to me many, many people believe in the possibility of a much better world and are fighting for that in different ways. Um, and uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't pin the red flag specifically to the belief that sort of things can be better. Um, I think it would have more to do with uh, sort of what degree of rigidness are you, um, you know, relating to that belief with, how are you uh, kind of, how are you acting on it in the world? How much are you willing to kind of, um, kind of break things or kind of act in uncooperative ways in virtue of, of that sort of conviction? And there, I think um, uh, caution is definitely warranted. I see. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I agree that um, most people have a view uh, or an ideology that implies um, uh, anywhere close to the kind of utopia that uh, one uh, utopian thinking one can have. Like if you think of modern political parties in a developed uh, democracy, uh, like in the United States, for example, if you think of uh, what is like a utopian vision that either party has, it's like it's actually quite uh, quite banal. It's like, oh, we'll have universal health care, or I don't know, GDP will be higher in the next uh, couple of decades, um, which is uh, which doesn't seem utopian to me. It just seems, and it does seem, um, it, it does seem like a limited worldview where they're not really thinking about how much better or worse things could be. But it doesn't exactly seem utopian. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let you react to that. I think that's a good point. So maybe the relevant notion of utopian here is something like, to what extent is a concept of a radically better world kind of operative in your day-to-day -day, uh, engagement? You know, to some extent, what I meant is that I think I think if I sat down and talked with most, uh, you know, most people, um, you know, we could eventually, with some kind of constraints on reasonableness, come to agree that things could be a lot better in the world. Like we could just cure cancer. We could cure, you know, X, Y, Z disease. We could just go through a few things like that. We could talk about um, the degree of abundance that could be available. Um, and I think, you know, so, but the question is whether that's like, a kind of structuring or important dimension to how people are relating to the world. And I think you're right that it's often not. And that's part of maybe um, the thing I'm hoping to uh, kind of push back against with that post is actually, I think this is a really important feature of our situation. Um, I think it's true that it's it can be dangerous. And if you're wrong about it, or if you're acting um, in the right, in a sort of um, unwise way with respect to it, that can be really bad. But I also think it's just it's just a really basic fact. And I think we just sort of need to learn to deal with it maturely and kind of pretending it's not true, I think isn't the way to do that. I see. Um, but uh, to me, at least utopian or utopia sounds like uh, some sort of peak. Um, and maybe you didn't mean it this way, but uh, so are, are you saying in the essay and generally that you think there is some sort of caring capacity to how much good things can get or that beyond a certain point, things can keep getting in, um, indefinitely better. Uh, but at this point, we're willing to say that we have reached utopia. Yeah, so I mean, I certainly don't have a kind of hard threshold. Uh, you know, here's here's exactly where, where I'm going to call it utopia. Um, you know, I mean something that is profoundly better. Uh, I do think that if you have a finite, so, you know, the very basic level, if there's only a finite number of states that uh, the sort of affectable universe can be in, um, and your your ranking of these states in terms of how good they are is uh, transitive and complete, um, then there will be a sort of top, <laughs> um, a top, and and I, you know I don't think that's an important thing to focus on from the perspective of just getting it just you know, taking seriously that things could be radically better at all. I think like talking about, ah, but exactly how good and what's the perfect thing is, is often kind of um, distracting in that respect. And it gets into these issues about like, oh, you know, um, how much suffering is good to have. And, and, and a lot of this sort of discourse on utopia, I think gets distracted from basic facts about like, at the very least, we can do just a ton better. Um, and that's important to keep in mind. I see, I see. You, you point out in the piece that many religions and spiritual movements have done the most amount of thinking on what a utopia could look like. And, you know, there, there, there's a very interesting um, essay by Nick Bostrom in 2008, where he lays out his vision of what somebody speaking from the future utopia talking back to us would sound like. And when you read it, it sounds very much like a sort of mystical a uh, mystical essay, the kind of thing that uh, a change a few words and a Christian could write, like C.S. Lewis could have written about like what it's like to speak down from heaven. Um, yeah, so, so, so to what, what extent is there, uh, I, and I don't, I don't mean this pejoratively, but uh, to, uh, what, to what extent is there some sort of like uh, spiritual or religious dimension to utopian thinking uh, that relies on some amount of faith that things can get in sort of uh, indescribably better in some sort of ephemeral, indescribable way? So I think there are definitely analogs and similarities between some ways of relating to the notion of utopia and uh, attitudes and orientations that are common in religious contexts and spiritual contexts. And I think it's, um, and I think personally, uh, I, so I don't think it needs to be that like that. I, as I say, I think I don't think it requires faith. I don't think it requires anything mystical. Um, I don't think, I think this is, it's just a basic, fact um, about our kind of current, uh, you know, our current cognitive situation, our current civilizational situation, that um, things could be radically better. Um, and uh, it's a, you know, it's ephemeral in the sense that it's quite hard to imagine, especially, you know, for me, an important, an important source of evidence here is, is sort of variance in the quality of human experiences. So if you think about your kind of peak experiences, um, they're often, it's it's a really big deal. You're kind of you're kind of sitting there going, "Wow, this is radically this is serious," um, and uh, kind of feeling in touch or, or feeling that this is this is uh, in some sense a, a, a um, 
something you would trade much, much sort of mundane experience for the sake of. Um, and I think it's important. So the thing that I think we need to do is sort of extrapolate from there. So you sort of look at the trajectory that your mind moved along as you as you moved into some experience or some broader non-experiential, like your community got a lot better, your relationships got about a lot better. Look at that trajectory and then sort of stare down, you know, where is that going? Um, and I do think that requires a kind of, I don't want to call it faith. I think it requires a kind of um, extrapolation into a sort of zone that is in some sense beyond your experience, but that is sort of deeply worthy and important. And I think that's um, something that uh, is often associated with, with spirituality um, and religion. And I think, uh, I think that's okay. Um, but I, I actually think there's a, there are a number of really important differences between utopia and something like heaven. Um, so, you know, centrally, utopia will be a sort of concrete, limited situation. There, you know, there are going to be frictions, there are going to be resource constraints, uh, it's going to be finite. Um, there's, there's a bunch of, it, it's still going to be in the real world, whereas I think um, uh, many you know, most religious visions have don't have don't have those constraints, and that's an important an important feature of their um, uh, uh, yeah of their their situation. Yeah, speaking of constraint uh, constraints, this reminds me of Robin Hanson's theory that uh, you know eventually the universal economy will just be made up of um, these digital people M's, and that because of competition, their wages will be driven down to subsistent levels. Uh, which um, may maybe that's compatible with some engineering in their ability to experience such that, you know, it it's still blissful for them to work at subsistence levels of compute or whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, so it, it seems like this sort of like uh, the first order economic thinking implies that there will be no, there'll be no utopia. In fact, things will get um, things will get worse for on average, but maybe better uh, overall if you just add up all the experience, but worse on average. Uh, yeah, so, so I don't know, it, it, this vision seems incompatible with yours of a utopia. What, what, what do you think? Yeah, I would not call uh, Robin's world a utopia. Uh, and so, you know, a, a thing I haven't been talking about is what should our overall probability distribution be with respect to different quality of futures? Um, and what, um, you know, exactly how possible is it uh, and how likely is it that we we build something that is sort of profoundly good as opposed to uh, mediocre or much worse? Um, and uh, I would class Robin's scenario in the uh, mediocre or uh, or much worse zone. But 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 so do you have a, a criticism of the logic he uses to derive that? To some extent, I think my main my main criticism or the first thing that, that would come to mind is that I think we will very likely. Um, uh, like I think competitive pressures are uh, are a source of kind of kind of pushing pushing uh, the world in in bad directions. But I also think there are ways in which um, kind of wise forms of coordination and kind of preemptive action can uh, can stave off the sort of bad effects of, of competitive pressures. And I, and and so that's that's a sort of um, that's the way I imagine avoiding. Uh, stuff in the vicinity of of what robin is talking about though you know there, there are a lot of complexities there yeah yeah um the last few years have not reinforced my uh my, my belief in the possibility of wise coordination but uh yeah yeah uh anyways so um yeah well, one thing i want to talk to you about is you have a, a paper on what what it would take to match uh humans brains uh, computational capacity um, uh, and then associated with that, you have, uh, you know, a, a very good summary on open philanthropy. Um, yeah. So do, do, do you want to talk about, uh, the approach you took to estimate this and then why, why this is an important metric to try to figure out? Yeah. So, um, the approach I took was to look at the evidence from neuroscience and the literature on, uh, the kind of computational capacity of the human brain and to talk to a bunch of neuroscientists and to try to, you know, see, see what we know right now about, uh, the, uh, the number of floating point operations per second uh, that would be sufficient to kind of reproduce the task relevant uh, aspects of human cognition in a computer. Um, and that's important. I, I mean, it's actually not, it, you know, it's not clear to me exactly how important this parameter is to our overall picture. Um, I think the way in which it, it's uh, relevant to thinking that I've been doing and that OpenPhil has been doing is um, as 
an input into an overall methodology for estimating when we might see uh, kind of human level AI systems that proceeds by first trying to estimate roughly the, the kind of computational capacity of the brain or the, or the sort of um, uh, the sort of size of size of a uh, kind of AI system and it's, it's kind of overall parameter count uh, and uh, kind of compute capacity and that would be sort of analogous to humans and then you extrapolate from that to the training cost the cost to kind of create a system um, of that kind using uh, current methods in machine learning and kind of current scaling scaling laws uh, and um, that methodology, though, brings in a number of additional assumptions that I think aren't um, aren't like just transparent. That that's oh yeah, of course that's how we would do it, or that. And so um, I think you have to sort of be a little bit more in the weeds to see exactly how it um, how it feeds in. I see. And then yeah, so what, what, what I think you said it was ten to the fifteen flops uh, for um, for human brain. But like, what, did you have an estimate for how many flops it would take to train uh, to train something like the human brain? I know GPT three is like. Um, only 175 billion parameters or something, which is can fit into a, you know, like a, a micro SD card even. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it was like oh, $20 million to train. So, um, yeah. So do you have, did, were you able to come up with some sort of estimate for how you, what it would cost to train something like this? Yeah. So my focus in that report was not on the training extrapolation. That was work uh, that Ajaya Katra at Open Philanthropy did um, using my report's estimate as an input. And uh, that her methodology involves assigning different probabilities to different kind of ways of using that that input uh, to 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 drive an overall training estimate. Um, and in particular, an important source of uncertainty there is uh, the kind of amount of compute required or the sort of number of times you need to run a system per data point that it gets. So in the case of something like GPT-3, you get a, a meaningful data point and a gradient update as to how well you're performing um, with each token that you output as you're doing GPT-3 style training. So you're, you know, you're predicting text from the internet, you know, you, you suggest the next token and then your training process says like, nope, do better next time or something like that. Whereas if you're uh, say learning to play Go and you have to play, uh, I mean, this isn't exactly how, or this isn't how a Go system will work, but it's, a, it's an example. If you have to play the full game out and that's sort of hundreds of moves, um, then before you get a, an update as to whether uh, you know, you're playing well or poorly, then uh, that's a big multiplier on, on the compute requirement. And so that's, that's one of the central pieces that's called uh, what Ajay calls the horizon length of, of training. And um, that's a sort of very important uh, source of uncertainty in getting to your overall overall uh, training estimate. I think, but ultimately, you know, she ends up with this big spread out distribution from something like, I think GPT-3 was like um, 10 to the 24, yeah, four times 10 to the 23 or something like that. And, you know, she's she spreads out all the way up to the evolution anchor, I think is something like 10 to the 41. And uh, I think her distribution is centered somewhere in the low 30s. Okay, that's that, that's still quite a bit, I guess. Um, how much does this rely on the you know the scaling hypothesis? If if one thought that the current efforts and the current approach were not um, not likely to lead in a, or at least in not likely to sample efficient way towards uh, towards human intelligence, you know, it might be analogous to somebody saying we have um, enough deuterium on Earth to power civilization for millions of years. Um, uh, but but if we haven't figured out fusion, then it, it, it may be irrelevant uh, statistic. Yeah, so I think. The approach does assume that you can train a human level or sort of uh, transformative AI system um, with a sort of non-astronomical amount of compute and data using current, you know, without without major conceptual or algorithmic breakthroughs relative to, to what's currently available. Um, now, the, the actual methodology of data uses allows you to assign probabilities to that assumption too. So you can, if you want, you know, say I'm only 20% on that. Um, and then uh, you have, then there are sort of other, uh, there are a few other options. So you can also kind of rerun evolution, which is not, uh, and, and, and so that's, that's an anchor that she provides to sort of, uh, and this is often what people will say as a sort of upper bound on how hard it is to create, um, to create human level systems is, is to do something, something analogous to, to, um, to simulating evolution. Um, though that, you know, there are a lot of open questions as to how, how hard that is. Um, but I do think this methodology uh, is a lot more compelling and interesting if you um, are compelled by the uh, the kind of available techniques in deep learning and, and by and by kind of scaling hypothesis like views at least in as an upper bound. I think it's important 
so, you know, there's different ways of, of kind of being interested in algorithmic breakthroughs. One is because you think deep learning isn't enough. Another is because you think they will sort of provide a lot of efficiency relative to deep learning such that an estimate like a J is, is an overestimate because actually, you know, we won't have to do that. We'll make some sort of breakthrough and it'll happen a lot earlier. Um, and, uh, uh, and I put, I put weight on that view as well. Yeah, that's really interesting. So the, yeah, that, that implies that it, it, like e even if you think the current uh, techniques are not uh, not optimal, maybe that maybe that should update you in favor of thinking it could happen sooner. That's that's really interesting. Um, uh, um, yeah. So yeah, then how how did you go about estimating uh, like uh, the amount of flops it would take to emulate uh, the interactions that happen in a brain? Uh, obviously, it, it, it would be unreasonable to say that you have to emulate every single atomic uh atomic interaction um uh, but then what is what, what is your proxy that you think it would be sufficient to emulate so i used a few different methodologies and tried to kind of synthesize them so one was looking at the kind of mechanisms of the brain and what we know about uh the kind of complexity of what they're doing and how hard it is to, to capture the kind of task relevant or our best our best guess about the task relevant dimensions of the the, the signaling happening in the brain um and then i also tried to bring in comparisons with uh, existing AI systems that are replicating kind of chunks of functionality um, that humans, uh, that the human brain has, and in particular in the context of vision. Um, so sort of uh, how, do our, how do our current um, vision systems compare with uh, the parts of the brain that uh, are kind of plausibly doing analogous processing, though they're often, they're often doing other things as well. Um, and then I used a third method, which is, has to do with physical limits on the kind of energy consumption per unit computation um, that the brain is possibly doing. And then a fourth method I sort of gesture at, which tries to extrapolate from uh, the communication capacity of the brain uh, to its computational capacity using comparisons with, uh, with current computers. So it's sort of a triangulation of like, a, you look at a bunch of different sources of evidence, all of which in my opinion are pretty weak. I think we are, um, uh, we're quite, well, the, the physical limit stuff is, is maybe more complicated, but it's sort of an upper bound. Um, I think we are significantly uncertain about all of this, and and I, my distribution is, is is pretty spread out. Um, but uh, the hope is that by looking at a bunch of things at once, you can at least get um, a sort of educated guess. And then yeah, so I, I'm very curious. Um, uh, is, is there consensus in neuroscience or uh, other relevant fields that we understand the signaling mechanisms well enough that we can say like basically this is what it's involved. Um, this is what the system is reducible to. Um, and yeah, so this is how many bits you need to represent uh, at an all the synaptic connections here. Or I, I, is there a variance of opinion about like uh, just how complicated the uh, the enterprise is? Uh, there's definitely disagreement, and um, it was you know interesting and in some sense disheartening to talk with neuroscientists about just how uh, <laughs> you know <laughs> how difficult neuroscience is. You know, it's, it's sort of I think it's easy. A, a consistent message, and I have a, a section on this in the report, um, was kind of how far we are from really understanding uh, what's going on in the brain, um, especially at a kind of algorithmic level. Um, that said, so in some sense, the report is somewhat opinionated in that, um, you know, there are experts that I found more compelling than others. Uh, there are experts who are much more in a sort of agnosticism mode of like, we just don't know, um, you know, th the brain is really, really complicated, who sort of err on the side of uh, very large compute estimates, a lot of emphasis on biophysical detail, a lot of emphasis on sort of mysterious things that could be happening that aren't happening. And then there are other neuroscientists who are more, uh, uh, you know, more willing to say stuff like, well, we, we kind of basically know what's what's going on at a mechanistic level, which isn't the same as knowing kind of the algorithm, the, the sort of algorithmic organization overall and how to replicate it. I sort of lean towards the latter view, though I give weight to both and 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 try to, um, yeah, try to synthesize the the kind of opinions of people I, I, I saw overall. Just looking at the the post itself, I, I haven't really looked deeper into the actual um, the the uh, the paper from which it's derived. Uh, but it seems like you were to estimate the flaws me mechanistically. You were adding up the different systems that play here. Um, yeah, so sh should we expect it to be additive in that way, or maybe it's like multiplicative, or there's more complicated interaction? At, like the flops grow super linearly to the inputs. Uh, the, the, I know that probably sounds really naive having studied it, but just like from a uh, first glance kind of uh, way that, that uh, that's a question I had. Yeah, so the, the way I was understanding um, and breaking down the forms of 
processing that you you would need to replicate in the brain um, made uh, made them seem not multiplicative in this way. So, uh, you know, a, an example would be if you think about, I mean, yes, yeah, sort of a simple example. So suppose we have some neurons and they're, uh, you know, they're signaling centrally via spikes through synapses or something like that. And then we have uh, glial cells as well, which are signaling via like slower calcium waves. Uh, and it's a sort of separate, uh, separate network. Um, you know, you could think that if it were something like, you know, the, the rate of calcium signaling is, um, uh, dependent on the rate of spikes through synapses or something like that, then that's an important interaction. Uh, uh, but you know, overall, if if you sort of imagine like this this kind of network processing, um, uh, these are kind of you can just you you can estimate them independently and then and then add it up. It's they're not they're not actually multiplicative processes on that on that conception. Um, I do think there are kind of correlations between the estimates for for um, the different parts, but I uh, it, it's sort of additive at a fundamental level. I see. Okay. And then, yeah, how, how much credence do you put in um, the sort of uh, almost woo-woo hypotheses that, I don't know, Roger Penrose has that thing about there's something like uh, something quantum mechanical happening in the brain that's very important in uh, well, for understanding cognition. Uh, yeah, to, to what extent uh, do, do you put credence in those kinds of hypotheses? I put very little credence in those <laughs> hypotheses. Um, uh, yeah, I don't see a lot of reason... To think that, um, I see a good amount of reason not to think it, um, but it wasn't something I dug in on a ton. Okay, gotcha. All right, so you have this really interesting blog post about infinite ethics. Um, do you want to talk about why this is an important topic, why it's important to integrate into our worldview, and so on? Sure. So infinite ethics is ethics that tries to grapple with how we should uh, act with respect to kind of infinite worlds um, and how should we, you know, how should we rank them? Um, how should they enter into our uh, our expected utility calculations or our attitudes towards risk? Um, and I think this is important for both kind of theoretical and practical reasons. So I think at a theoretical level, when you when you try to do this with a lot of common um, ethical theories and constraints and principles, um, they just break on uh, on infinite worlds. Um, and uh, I think that's a, that's an important clue as to their viability because I think infinite worlds are at the very least possible, um, even if our world is finite, um, and even if our causal influence is finite or our influence overall is finite, um, it's possible uh, to have infinite worlds, and we have opinions about them. You know, like an infinite heaven is better than an infinite hell, and you know, uh, so I think um, often in ethics we 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 expect our ethical principles to extend to um, kind of ranking scenarios or, or sort of acting in hypothetical scenarios or overall kind of to, to um, all possible situations rather than just our actual situation. And I think um, uh, infinities come in there. But then I think maybe more importantly, um, I think it's a it's a, an issue with practical relevance. Um, and a way to see that is that, you know, I think we should have non-zero credence that we live in an infinite world. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a very live uh, physical hypothesis that the universe is infinite, even if I think the, the, the mainstream view is that our causal influence on that universe um, is finite in virtue of things like entropy and, and light speed and stuff like that. Um, but the, the universe itself may well be infinite in, in um, uh, you know, uh, and possibly infinite in a number of different ways. Uh, uh, if that sort of Max Tegmark has some work on all the different kind of like large, <laughs> you know, ways the universe can be really very large. There's a number of ways that yeah, I think it's just we should have non-zero credence that that we we can have um, infinite influence in our actions now. Um, so uh, you know our kind of the causal influence, our the the limitations there could be wrong. It may be that there are ways you know in the future we'll be able to do infinite things. Um, and then I also think somewhat more uh, uh, exotically that um, it's there. There's sort of ways of having a causal influence um, on a, on an infinite universe, even if you are uh, limited in your causal influence. And that comes from some additional work I've done on decision theory. Um, and so, if you try to incorporate that, if you're a sort of expected value reasoner, um, it just very quickly starts to dominate or at least break your expected value calculation. So you know, you mentioned long-termism earlier, uh, and you know, a natural reason, a natural argument for, for getting interested in long-termism is, oh, you know, in the future, there could be all these people, their lives are incredibly important. So if you do the EV calculation, sort of your effect on them is what dominates. Um, but actually, if you have even a tiny credence that you can do an infinite thing, uh, you know, either that dominates or it breaks. And then if you have tiny credences on doing different types of infinite things and you need to compare them, um, you need to know how to do it. Uh, and so I just think this is actually, you know, it's actually a part of our of our epistemology now, um, though it's, I think we often don't, uh, 
uh, don't treat it that way because we're often not doing EV reasoning or really thinking thinking about that. Um, that uh, that these are questions that that just apply to us. Yeah, yeah. The, the, so that's that's so super fascinating. Um, I, 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 if it is the case that we can only have an impact on a finite amount of stuff, then maybe it is true that like there's infinite suffering or happiness in the universe at large, but. Uh, the delta between uh, the best case scenario for what we do and the best worst case scenario is finite. Um, but yeah, it, it, I don't know. That still seems less compelling if the the, the hell or heaven we're surrounded by is uh, overall not uh, yeah, doesn't change. Um, uh, I, I, can you talk a bit more? I think you mentioned uh, in your other work on having impact, uh, it, having infinite impact beyond uh, the, the scope of what light speed and entropy would allow us. Can, can you talk a bit more about how that might be possible? Sure. So, um, you know, uh, a common decision theory, um, though it's not, I think, the mainstream decision theory, it's a contender in the literature, is evidential decision theory, where you should act um, such that uh, you would be, you know, roughly speaking, happiest to learn that you had acted that way for that reason. <laughs> um, and uh, so the reason this allows you kind of a causal influence, uh, so, you know, a way of thinking about it is suppose that you are a... Um, uh, deterministic simulation, um, and there's a copy of you being run uh, sort of too far away for uh, for you to ever uh, causally interact with it, right? Um, but you know that it's a sort of, um, it, you know, it's uh, it's a deterministic copy, and so it'll do exactly what you do, absent some sort of computer malfunction. Um, and now uh, you're deciding whether to give uh, you know, you have two options. You can send a million dollars to that. Well, it's a little complicated because he's too far away. But, um, uh, you know, just in general, like if I raise my hand or if I want to write stuff on, on my whiteboard, right, um, or if I'm going to, uh, you know, there's, let's say I have to make some ethical decision, like whether I should take an expensive vacation um, or I should donate that money to save someone's life, because that the, the other guy uh, is going to act just like I do, um, even though I can't cause him to do that. In some sense, when I when I make my choice um, after doing so, I should think that he made the same choice. And so, evidential decision theory treats his action as, in some sense, under my control. Um, and so, uh, if you imagine an infinite universe where there are an infinite number of copies of you, or even not copies, people whose actions are correlated with you, such that when you act a certain way, that gives you evidence about what they do. Um, in some sense, their actions are under your control. And so, if there are an infinite number of them. Uh, on evidential decision theory and a few other decision theories, uh, then uh, in some sense, you're having influent influence on the universe. Yeah, this sounds really similar to um, the, the thought experiment and quantum mechanics called EPR pair, uh, you, which, you, which you might have heard of. But the basic idea is if you have two entangled bits and you take them very far away from each other, and then you measure one of them and you do like before they're brought apart, you come up to some rule that like, Hey, if, if, if it's plus, we do this, if it's minus, we do the other thing. It, it seems uh, at first glance that measuring something yourself, uh, has an impact on what the other person does, even though, um, it shouldn't be allowed, uh, uh, uh by light speed, uh, it, it gets resolved if you take the many worlds view, but, um, um, yeah, yeah. So the, 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 that's very interesting. Is this just a uh, thought experiment or is this something that we should anticipate for uh, some cosmological reason to actually be a way we could have influence on the world? So I haven't dug into the cosmology a lot, but my understanding is that it's at the very least a very live hypothesis that the universe is um, infinite in the sense that there are um, you know, it's just sort of infinite in extent, and there are, uh, you know, suitably far away, um, there are copies of us having just this conversation, and then, you know, even further away, there are copies of us having this conversation, but wearing raccoons for hats, um, and, you know, and and all the rest, um, which, you know, is itself something to wonder about and sit with, but I, you know, my understanding is this is, this is just a live hypothesis, and, and that more broadly, um, kind of infinities playing, you know, infinite universes are just sort of a part of, of, uh, of mainstream cosmology at this point. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think it, I think I don't think it's just a thought experiment. I think infinite universes are are live, and then I think um, uh, you know these sort of non-causal decision theories are actually my sort of best guess decision theories, um, though that's not a mainstream view. Uh, so uh, it's fairly, um, I think it comes in fairly directly and substantively if you have that combination of views. But then I also think it comes in. Uh, I think everyone should have non-zero credence in all sorts of different infinity-involving hypotheses, and so infinite ethics gets a grip. Regardless, I see. Um, and then, 
So taking that example, um, if if you're having an impact on every identical copy of yourself in the infinite universe, it seems that for any such copy, there's infinite amount of other copies that are slightly different. So it's not even clear if you're increasing. Maybe it makes no sense to talk about proportions in an infinite universe. But you know, if there is another infinite set of copies that scribbled the exact opposite thing on the whiteboard, then it's um, it's not clear that you had any impact on the total amount of good or bad stuff that happened. I, I don't know. My brain breaks here, but maybe you can help me understand this. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a general, I think there's a couple of dimensions here, there. So one is um, trying to understand actually what sort of difference does it make if you're in this sort of infinite situation and you're thinking about a causal influence, um, what even did you change? Um, at, at a sort of empirical level before you talk about how to value that. Um, and I think that's a pretty gnarly question. Um, even if we settled that question though, in terms of like the empirical uh, a causal impact, uh, there's a further question of how do, you, how do you rank that or how do you deal with um, you know, the sort of the normative dimension here? And there, you know, so that's the sort of ethical question and there things get really gnarly very fast. Um, and, you know, so, uh, and in fact, there are kind of um, impossibility results that show that even very basic constraints that you really would have thought that we could get um, at the same time in our ethical theories, uh, you can't get them at the same time um, when when you come when it comes to infinite universes. Um, and uh, so we know that something is going to have to go and change if we're going to extend our ethics to to infinities. I see, but then. Um... Yeah. So, and then, what, what, is there some reason you settled on? I, I guess you mentioned you're not a utilitarian, but on some version of EA or long-termism as your tentative moral hypothesis, despite the fact that this seems unresolved. And then, like, how, how, how do you set the, that tension while uh, tentatively uh, remaining in EA? Yeah. So, I think there's a there's two dimensions there. One is that I think it's um, I think it's good practice to not totally upend your life and do, and, and, you know, if you encounter some destabilizing philosophical idea, especially one that's sort of difficult and, you know, you don't totally have a grip on it to, to then come back. But isn't, like, isn't that what long-termism is? Yeah. So I think there's a real tension there in that I think um, many, you know, how seriously should we take these ideas? At what point should you be making what sorts of changes for your life on the basis of different, different things that you're, um, uh, you're thinking and believing, you know, it's a real art, right? And I think some people go, you know, they grab the first idea they see um, and they start doing crazy stuff and uh, in an unwise way. And some people are too, um, it's kind of sluggish and they, they're not willing to take ideas seriously and not willing to reorient their their life on the basis of, of uh, changes in what, in what seems true. Um, but I think, you know, nevertheless, I think especially things that involve like, ah, it turns out it's fine to, you know, do terrible things or, you know, there's no reason to eat your lunch or whatever, like things that, you know, sort of really, really holistically breaking of your ethics views, I think, I think one should, should tread very cautiously with. Um, so that's one aspect. At a philosophical level, um, the way I resolve it is I think for many of these issues, uh, the right path forward, or at least a path that looks pretty good is to um, survive long enough for our civilization to become much wiser. Um, and if it, as, and and then to use that position of wisdom and empowerment uh, to act better with respect to these issues. Um, and so, and that's what I say in the end of the Infinite Ethics post is that, um, you know, I think future civilization, if all goes well, will be much better equipped to deal with this. Um, and, you know, we are at, we are at square one in kind of really understanding how, how, how these issues play out and how to respond. And so uh, I think both at an empirical level and at a, at a kind of philosophical level. Um, and so it, it looks convergently pretty good to me to survive, become wiser, keep your options open, and then act from there. Um, and that looks, that ends up pretty similar to a lot of long-termism and existential risk. It's just that it's focused less on, and the main event will be what happens to future people. And it's, it's more about getting to the point where we are wise enough to understand and reorient um, in a better way. Okay. Um, yeah. So what, what I find really interesting about this is that you can, um, yeah, you, uh, so uh, different people tend to have like different thresholds for um, epistemic learned helplessness, where they basically say, this is too weird. I'm not going to think about this. Uh, let's just stick with my current uh, 
current uh, moral theories. Um, so for, for sort of somebody else, it might be before they became a long-term risk where it's just like, yeah, trillions of future people, what, what are we talking about here? Let's, uh, we're, we're not changing my mind on stuff. And then, yeah, for, for you, maybe it's before the infinite ethics stuff. Um, uh, is, is there some uh, principled reason for thinking that this is where that stop should be? Or is it just a matter of like temperament and openness? So I don't think there's a principled reason. And, and I should say, I don't think of my attitude towards infinite ethics as solely, oh, this has gotten too far down the crazy, the crazy path. I'm out. Um, it is this thing about the wisdom in the future is pretty important to me. Um, as a as a a, a reason uh, uh, as an as a motive orientation, a first pass cut that I use is when do you feel like it's real? Um, if you feel like a thing is real, uh, as opposed to a kind of abstract fun argument, um, then that's important or that's that's a real signal. And I think I so. Um, uh, and I generally encourage people if, if the, the sort of mode that I I, I, I I don't know, I'm drawn to is something like if there's an idea that seems compelling intellectually, that's a reason to investigate it a lot and think about it and really grapple with, you know, if, if this doesn't seem right to you or if it seems too crazy, why? Um, and really kind of processing, you know, it's a reason to pay a lot of attention. But if you've paid a lot of attention at the end of the day, you're like, well, I guess at an abstract level, that sort of makes sense. But it just doesn't feel to me like the real world. It just doesn't feel to me like um, wisdom or you know, like a healthy way of living or whatever. Then I'm like, well, maybe you shouldn't do it. Right. I mean, it's, and, and, uh, and I think some people will do that wrong and they will end up bouncing off of ideas that are in fact good. Um, but, you know, I think overall, these these are sort of sufficiently intense and difficult issues that um, uh, kind of being actually persuaded and not just sort of chopping off the rest of your epistemology for the sake of some like version of the abstraction uh, is uh, it seems to me important and it's and it's a sort of a healthier way to relate. Yeah. So another example of this um, is that you have this really interesting blog post on ants uh, and <laughs> the, your uh, the, your 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 thoughts after uh, uh, sterilizing a colony of them. So um, I uh, yeah. So this is another example of a thing where uh, almost everybody, other than I don't know, maybe a Jane who wears a face mask to prevent bugs from going into his mouth would agree, uh, say like, okay, at this point, if we're talking about how many hedons are in a hectare of forest from all the millions of insects there, um, then uh, you've lost me. Um, but then, you know, somebody else might say, okay, well, there, there's not a strong reason for thinking they have no, absolutely no capacity to feel suffering. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I, I wonder how you think about such questions because you can't like stop living and not kill. You're you're not even going to stop going on road trips where you're probably killing hundreds of insects by just driving. Um, but yeah, so how, how, what do you think about such conundrums? The I have significant uncertainty about you know exactly, and I think this is the appropriate position about exactly how much uh, kind of consciousness or suffering or other forms of moral you know other ways other kind of properties that we associate with moral patienthood, how much those apply to different, um, different types of insects. Um, I think it's a strange view to be, you know, extremely confident that uh, what happens with insects is uh, totally morally neutral. And I think it actually doesn't fit with our common sense. So let's say you see, if you see a child like frying ants uh, with, uh, with a magnifying glass, I think we, you know, there is some, uh, you know, what you could say, ah, well, that just indicates that they're going to be cruel to other things that matter. Um, but uh, I don't think so. I think, you know, and you see the ants like, you know, and they're, they're twitching around and, and, and um, I, so I think we aren't, um, it, you know, as in many cases with, an, with animal ethics, I think we're a bit like kind of schizophrenic about, about what cases we, we view as sort of morally relevant and, and which, which not, um, you know, we have, we have, you know, pet treatment laws and then we have factory farms and, and stuff like that. Um, so, I don't see it as a radical position that ants matter somewhat. Um, I think there's a further question of what your overall practical response should to that should be. And I think um, the main, uh, and I do think uh, the kind of costs as, as in a lot of ethical life, there are trade-offs and you have to make, um, you have to make a call about what, what sort of constraints you're going to put on yourself at the cost of other goals. And um, in, you know, in the case of insects, it's not my, my current moral focus and I don't pay a lot of costs to kind of um, 
uh, to lower my impact on animals. And, and I don't, you know, <laughs> I don't, I don't sweep the sidewalk or, or any, or sorry, on, on, on ants in particular. Um, uh, and so I think it's, I think, and I think that's, you know, that's my best guess response. And that, and that has to do with other ethical priorities in my life. Um, but I think, you know, there's, there's a middle ground between um, I shall ignore this completely and I shall, you know, be a Jane, um, which is recognizing that this is a, this is a real trade-off. There's uncertainty here and, um, uh, and taking responsibility for how you're responding to that. Yeah, this seems um, kind of similar to the infinite ethics example, where if you put any sort of credence that um, they have any ability to suffer, then at least if you're uh, not going to say that, oh, but, uh, it doesn't matter because like the far future, trillions and trillions of ants. Um, <laughs> um, it, it seems like this should be uh, a, a compelling, uh, uh, a, a, a compelling thing to think about. But then the result is, um, yeah, it's it's not even like become a vegan where it's like you change your diet. Um, uh, and then, so, you know, as you might know, this is used as a reductive ad absurdum of veganism, where, you know, if you're going to start caring about other uh, non-human animals, why not also care about insects? And even if they're worth like a millionth of a cow, then, you know, you're probably still killing like a million of them on any given day from all your activities, uh, indirectly, maybe, uh, like, I, I don't know, like the food you're eating, all, all the pesticides that are used to create that food. But I, I don't know how you go about resolving that kind of stuff. I mean, I guess I'd want to really hear the empirical case. I think um, uh, I think it's true. You know, there are a lot of insects, uh, and but you know, I think it's easy. Uh, you know, I think if you want to say like ah, taking seriously uh, sort of th the idea that um, there's some reason to to not like squash squash a bug <laughs> um, if you see it leads immediately to kind of Jane like behavior uh, absent long-termism or something like that. I, I really, I, I feel like I want to hear the empirical case about like exactly what impact you're having and, and how, um, and, and I'm not at all persuaded that that's the practical upshot. Um, uh, and if it is, if that's a really strong case, then I think that's an interesting, um, an interesting, uh, uh, you know, that's an interesting kind of implication of, of this view. Um, and, uh, and, you know, worth, worth concern, but I wouldn't jump. It, it feels to me like it's easy to jump to that almost out of a desire to, to get to the reductio, um, without kind of, I would try to move slower and, and really see it's like, wait, is that right? There are a lot of trade-offs here. What's the source of my hesitation about that? Um, and kind of, uh, uh, and not, not jump too quickly to something that's sufficiently absurd that I can be like, ah, therefore I get to reject this whole mode of thinking, even though I don't know why. I see. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about uh, the two different ways of thinking about observer effects and their implications. So do, do, do you want to uh, explain, um, you, you have a four-part series on this, but do you want to explain uh, the uh, self-indication assumption and the self-sampling assumption? Uh, uh, I, I know it's a big topic, but uh, yeah, as much as possible. Sure. So I think one way to start to get into this debate is by thinking about the following case. So um, you wake up in a white room and there's a message written on the wall and let's say you're gonna believe this message. And the message says, I, God, it's from God. Um, I, God, created, I, I flipped a coin. Um, and if it was heads, I created one person in a white room. And if it was tails, I created a million people all in white rooms. And now you are asked to assign probabilities uh, to uh, the coin having come up heads versus tails. Um, and uh, so one approach to this question, um, uh, which is the approach I favor, or at least think is better than the other, uh, is the self the self indication assumption. Um, these names are terrible. Um, and uh, <laughs> but, you know, so it goes. Um, so SIA uh, says that uh, your probability that the coin came up heads should be approximately one in a million. Um, and that's because SIA thinks it's more likely that you exist in worlds where uh, there are more people in your epistemic situation or more people who have your evidence, which in this case is just waking up in this white room. Uh, and that's it. and so that's that can be a weird conclusion and go to weird places. Um, but I think uh, it's uh, a better conclusion than the alternative. SSA, uh, which is the, the main alternative I consider in that post, which is the, the self-sampling assumption, um, uh, says that you should, you think it more likely that you exist in worlds where people with your evidence are a larger fraction of uh, something called your reference class, um, uh, where 
it's quite opaque what, what a reference class is supposed to be, but broadly speaking, a reference class is the sort of set of people you could have been, or that's kind of how it functions in, in SSA's discourse. So um, uh, in this case, in both cases, everyone has your evidence. Um, and so the fraction is the same. Um, uh, and so you, you stick with the one half prior. Um, but that's not true. So SSA in other contexts, um, not everyone has your evidence. And so it updates towards worlds um, where it's a larger fraction. So famously, uh, SSA leads to what's known as the doomsday argument, um, where you imagine that uh, there are two possibilities. Either humanity will go extinct very soon, um, or we won't go extinct very soon, and there will be tons of people in the future. Um, and in the former case, uh, and then you imagine um, everyone is sort of ranked in terms of when they're born. Um, uh, in the former case, people born in, you know, at roughly this time um, are a much larger percentage of all the people who ever lived. Um, and so if you imagine you know, God first creates a world and then he inserts you randomly into like some group, it's much more likely uh, that you would find yourself in the 21st century um, if humanity goes extinct soon than if, it's, uh, if there are some, tons of people in the future. If God randomly inserted you into these tons of people in the future, then it's like, really, that's a, it's a tiny fraction of them are in the 21st century. Um, so SSA in other contexts actually, you know, it has these important implications, namely that in this case, you update very, very hard towards the future being short. Um, and that matters a lot for long-termism because uh, long-termism is all about the future being big in expectation. Okay, so and then how, what, what, is, what is the SIA take on this? Yeah, so I think a way to think about SIA's kind of story. So I gave this story about SS, SSA, which is, it's sort of like this. It's like, first, God creates a world. This is SSA. First, he creates a world. And then he takes, and he's dead set on, on putting you into this world. So you, he's got your soul, right? And he really wants, and your soul is going in there no matter what, right? Um, but the way he's going to insert your soul into the world is by throwing you randomly into some set of people, um, the reference class. Uh, and so if you wake, so you should expect um, to end up in the world where uh, the, the kind of person you end up as uh, is, is sort of um, more like a more likely result of that throwing process is a sort of larger fraction of, of the total people you could have been. What SSA or what SIA thinks is different. The way the story that I'll use for SIA, though it doesn't, this isn't the only gloss, is God dis decides he's going to create a world. And then he, and say there's like a big line of souls in heaven, and he goes and grabs them kind of randomly out of heaven and puts them into the world, right? And so in that case, if there are more people in the world, then you've got more shots. At the, and you're one of these souls. You're sort of sitting in heaven, hoping to get created. Um, uh, on SIA, God has more chances to grab you out of out of heaven and put you into the world if there are more people uh, who uh, more people like you in that world. Um, and so you should expect to be in a world where there was sort of there are there are more such people. And that that's that's kind of SIA's vibe. Doesn't this also imply that you should be in the future, assuming there will be more people in the future? Tell me more about why why it would imply that. Okay, in an analogous scenario, maybe like uh, go back to the, the God tossing the coin scenario, where if you did just uh, substitute for people in right rooms, you substitute mm -hmm. um, being a thing, uh, a conscious entity, and if there's going to be more conscious entities in the future, you, like you, you would really expect to, uh, just like in that example of being in that scenario where there's a lot more rooms, just as maybe you should expect you to be in that scenario where there's a lot more conscious beings, which presumably is the future. So then it's still odd that you're in the present uh, under SIA. Yes. So in, in a specific sense. So um, it's true that on SIA, uh, say that um, say that we don't know what room you're in first, right? So, so um, you, you wake up in the white room and you're wondering, uh, am I in room one? or am I in rooms two through a million, right? Um, and on SIA, what you did first, so you woke up and you don't know what room you're in, but there's a lot more people in the world with lots of rooms. And so you become very, very confident that you're in that world, right? So you're very, very confident on tails. And then you're right that uh, conditional on tails, you think it's uh, much more like, you, you sort of split your credence evenly between all these rooms. So you are uh, very confident that you're in one of the, the sort of two through a million rooms and not, not room one. Um, but that's before you've seen your room number. Um, 
once you see your room number, it's true that you should be quite surprised about your room number. Um, uh, but the uh, once you get the room number, you're back you back to 50-50 on uh, heads versus tails because you had sort of equal credence in being in room one, uh, conditional on tails. Um, or sorry, uh, you had equal credence in being in tails in room one uh, and uh, heads in room one. And so when you get rid of all of the other tails in rooms two through a million, you're left with 50-50 overall on heads versus tails. Um, and so uh, the, the sense in which SIA leaves you back at normality with the doomsday argument is once you update on being in the 21st century, which admittedly should be surprising. Like if you didn't know what, that you were in the 21st century, and then you learned that you were, you should be like, wow, that's really unexpected. And fair, so, and that's, that's true. But I think once you do that, you're back at, um, uh, you know, whatever your prior was about, about extinction. Maybe I'm still not sure on why the fact that you were surprised should not itself be the doomsday argument. Yeah, I think there's an intuition there, um, which is sort of like, yeah, is SIA making a bad prediction? So you, you, could, you could kind of update against SIA because SIA sort of oh. <laughs> would have predicted that you're in the future. Um, I, I think there's something there. And I think there's a few other analogs. Um, like for example, I think SIA naively predicts that um, you, you, know, you, you should find yourself in a situation where there are just tons of people that, you know, a situation obsessed with creating people with your evidence. Um, and you know, this is one of, the, one of the, the problems with SIA. So you should expect to find you know, in every nook and cranny a simulation of you. As soon as you, like, you, know, you open the door, it's actually this giant bank of simulations of you in like your previous <laughs> epistemic state. Um, and so, you know, I think there are, and, and then you don't see that you might be like, well, I should update against the anthropic theory that predicted uh, that I would see that. And I, I, I think there are arguments in that vein. Yeah. So maybe let's back up to go to the original example uh, uh, that we, we, that was used to distinguish these two theories. Yeah. So I, 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 can you help me resolve my intuitions here where my, my intuition is very much as to say, because um, yeah, it, it seems to me that uh, you knew you were going to wake up, right? You knew you were going to wake up in a white room before you actually did wake up. I mean, your prior should have been like one half heads or tails. So it's not clear to me why having learned nothing new, your, uh, your, your posterior probability on either of those scenarios should change. So I think the, the SIA response to that would be, or at least I think the, a way of making it intuitive would be to say that you didn't know that you were going to wake up, right? So in the... Um, if we go back to that just so story where God is grabbing you out of the um, out of heaven, uh, you know it, it's uh, it's not at all. It's actually incredibly unlikely that He grabs you. There are so many so many people. Yeah, I mean, there's a different thing where SIA is in general very surprised to exist, um, and in fact, that's uh, the. Um, so you could make the same arguments like SIA says you shouldn't exist. Isn't that weird that you exist? Um, and I actually think that's a, that's a good argument. Um, or is it, uh, so. Um, but uh, once you're in that headspace, then I think the way the way to think about it is that it's not a guarantee that you you were God is not dead set on creating you. You are a particular contingent arrangement of the world, um, and so that that you should expect that arrangement to to come about more often if there are more arrangements of that type, um, rather than sort of assuming that that no matter what existence will include you. Yes. Yeah, so okay. Can you talk more about the problems with SSA, like scenarios where you think it breaks down? Uh, with like why you prefer SIA? Yeah. So um, an easy an easy problem, uh, or sort of one of the most dramatic problems, is, is that SIA SSA um, predicts that uh, it's possible to have a kind of telekinetic influence on the world. So imagine that there's a um, there's a puppy. You you're you're in an, you you wake up and you're in an empty universe except for this puppy and and you and this boulder that's rolling towards the puppy, right? And the boulder is inexorably gonna kill the puppy. Um, it's a very large boulder. It's basically guaranteed that the puppy is dead meat. But you have the power to make binding pre-commitments um, that you will in fact execute. And, and you have also to your right, a button that would allow you to create tons of people, like zillions and zillions and zillions of people, all of whom um, are wearing different clothes from you. Uh, so they would be in a different epistemic state than you if you if you created them. Um, now SSA, uh, so you so you make the following resolution. You say um, if uh, this boulder does not jump out of the way of this puppy, um, like the boulder leaps in you know in some very weird, very unlikely way, um, uh, then I will press this button 
and I will create zillions and zillions of people, um, uh, all of whom are in a different epistemic state than me, but let's assume they were in my reference class. Um, SSA thinks that it's sufficiently unlikely that you would be in a world with zillions of those people um, and uh, but you, you know, you at the very beginning uh, with with a different with different colored clothes, because you know that's a tiny fraction of the reference class. If those people get created, um, that SSA thinks it's actually more likely once you've made that commitment that the boulder will jump out of the way. Um, and uh, and you know, so that and that looks weird, right? You, it's, it just seems like that's not going to work. You can't you can't just make that commitment and then expect the boulder to jump. Um, and you get so that so that's a sort of exotic example. You get you get similar analogs even in the God's coin toss case where. Um, like naively, it doesn't actually matter whether God has tossed the coin yet, right? So suppose, um, yeah, so like, let's say, let's say you wake up and learn that you're in room one, right? Um, but God hasn't tossed the coin. It's like he created room one first before he tossed, and then he's going to toss, and that's going to determine whether or not he creates all the rooms in the future. Um, if you, on SSA, once you wake up and learn, um, learn that you're in room one, you think it's incredibly unlikely that there's going to be these future people. So you, now you say, before the, it's a fair coin, God's going to toss it in front of you. You're still going to say, I'm sorry, God, it's, uh, you know, it's a one in a million chance that this, uh, that this coin lands tails. Um, and, uh, or sorry, one in a million, some, some like very small number. I forget exactly. I forget exactly. And, that's, um, and that's very weird. That's a fair coin. It hasn't been tossed. But you, with the power of SSA, have become extremely confident about about what how it's going to land, um, and that's uh, so that's that's an, another argument. There's a, there's a number of other uh, I think really really bad problems for SSA. Yeah, wh while I digest that, uh, so let, let, let me uh, let, let me just uh, mention the the problems you already pointed out against uh, SIA um, in, in the post and uh, earlier where where. If if one thinks SI is true, one should be very confident that there are you're you're in a universe with many other people who have been sampled just like you. And so then it's um then it's kind of surprising that we're in a universe that is not filled to the brim with people. Like there's a lot of um you, you could imagine like Mars is just com completely made up of bodies um or you know like every single star has like you know a, a simulation of a trillion people inside um the fact that this is not happening seems like uh it seems like very strong evidence against SIA and then you know there's other things like the presumptuous philosopher that you, you might want to talk about as well but um yeah so but do, do you just bite the bullet on these things or how, how do you think about these things my main claim is that SIA is better than SSA, um, and and I think it's just a horrible situation uh, with, with, with Anthropics. And and um, it's I, I think overall SIA is an update towards bigger, more populated universes. Um, I think you know the most salient populated universes don't involve like hidden people on other planets, but they're probably um, uh, I don't know, maybe we're in a simulation and people are, you know, obsessed with simulating us or, or, or something like that. Or, and then I think this is actually more important and worrying is I, I think the way I see this dialectic is um, first SIA, I mean, it's, so a big problem with SIA is it be, immediately becomes certain naively that you live in an infinite universe or a, a universe with an infinite number of people. Um, uh, and that and then it breaks because and it doesn't know how to compare um, uh, kind of infinite universes. Now, to be fair, SSA also isn't great at, at comparing infinite universes, um, and they both have some. You can do things that are actually quite analogous to things you can try to do in infinite ethics, where you have like expanding spheres of uh, of space time, and you you count you know you have some fraction or some density of people in those spheres. Um, and there's this general problem in cosmology of, of like trying to understand what, what it means to have like a fraction or a density of, of, of different types of observers. Um, but, you know, my own take is kind of what happens here is you, we hit this infinity, you, you hit infinite universes fairly fast, and then they kind of break your anthropics in analogous ways to how they break your ethics. Um, and that's kind of where I'm currently at. And I'm, I'm hoping to understand better uh, how to do anthropics with infinities um, and um, some of my work on the universal distribution, uh, which is a sort of, I have, a, I have a couple blog posts on that, was attempting to go a little bit in that direction, though it has its own giant problems. Okay, interesting. Um, uh, do you know if, um, just vaguely it seems to me that the Robin Hanson's Grabby Aliens thing probably uses SSA, uh, but do, 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 do you know if that's the case, uh, if he's using SSA in there? I don't. I haven't looked closely at that work. Okay. 
Okay, cool. I don't know. It, it's hard for me to think about. So maybe it'll take me a few more, few more weeks before I can uh, digest it uh, fully. But um, yeah, okay. So that, that, that's really interesting. You have a really interesting blog post about believing in things you cannot see. Um, and one, I mean, this is almost an aside in the post itself, but I thought it was a really interesting comment. You, you make an interesting comment about futurism. Uh, here's what you say. Much of futurism, in my experience, has a distinct flavor of unreality. The concepts, mind uploads, nanotechnology, settlement, and energy capture in space are, I think, meaningful, even if loosely defined. But at a certain point, one's models become so abstracted and incomplete that the sense of talking about a real thing, even a possibly real thing, is lost. Yeah, so uh, why do you think that is? And is there a way to do futurism better? I think it comes partly because imagination is just quite a limited tool. And it's just easy, you know, when you're talking about the whole world, like the future is a big thing to try to model with this tiny mind. And so, you know, of necessity, you need to use these extremely lossy abstractions. Um, and so, you know, uh, it puts you in a mode of having these like, you know, really sketchy and gappy maps that you're trying to, to manipulate. Um, I think that's one dimension. And then I think there's also a way in which, um, you know, this isn't all that unique to futurism in, insofar as just in general, I think it's hard sometimes to keep our uh, intellectual engagement kind of rooted and grounded in the, the kind of real world. And, I, you know, I think it's just easy to kind of move into a zone, and especially if that zone is inflected with kind of social dynamics or you're it's you know it's it's kind of like a intellectual game or you're enjoying it for its own sake or it's it's like a sort of there's sort of status dimensions and the way people talk and other things that I think start to move our our discourse in uh in directions that aren't about like ah we're talking about the real world right now let's actually get it right and I think that happens with futurism um and and maybe more so because it can feel like like I think some people it, there's sort of topics that they treat as like ah that's a real serious topic that's about real stuff and then there are other topics where it's like, this is the chance to kind of make stuff up. Um, and, you know, my experience is sometimes people relate to futurism that way. There are other topics where people move into a zone of like, one can just say stuff here. Um, and there are kind of no constraints. Uh, and I think, I think that's actually wrong. And, and, and with futurism, I think there are, there are important um, constraints and important things we can say. Um, but uh, I think that, can, that vibe can seep in nonetheless. Yeah, and it's interesting that it's true of the future and the past. Uh, I recently interviewed somebody who wrote a book about the Napoleonic War. And yeah, it, it, it's, I mean, it's very interesting to talk about it in a sort of abstract sense. But then also you can, um, which is very seldom done, you can like think of the reality of like a, a million men marching out of Russia and freezing and eating the remains of horses and other people and then starving. Um, and the, 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 then the, the concrete reality, when you're not, yeah, when you're done just talking about abstractions, like, oh, the border changed so much in these few decades or something. Um, yeah, j j just how you think about history changes so much and it becomes, um, yeah, the, the, even recently I was reading uh, the, this book about um, the, uh, the the use of meth by the Nazis. Um, and the, if you just, uh, there's there's this really cynical part of the book where the, the leaders um, in the in the Nazi regime, they're talking about like, oh, meth is a perfect drug because it gives them courage to kind of just blitz through an area um, without any sort of, uh, without thinking about how cold it is, without thinking about how scary it is to just be in no man's land. And just this idea of like this meth up soldier who's like been forced to uh, just go out into the middle of nowhere. Um, and yeah, and then all, all like marching to Russia or something uh, in the winter. I, I don't know if that was gonna lead up to a question. I, I don't know if you have a reaction, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I think that's a great example of, um, or it's, you know, specifically the sort of image of the difference between relating to history as this sort of how is the border changing versus the concreteness of these people. And, you know, often I think engaging with history is horrifying in this respect, is when you really bring to mind the, the lived reality of all these events. It's um, a really different uh, experience. And I think to some extent, one of the reasons that um, concreteness might be often lacking from futurism is that you can't, any, any attempt to specify the thing will be wrong. Um, so, you know, we can, you can, you might be right about some abstract thing. Like you might be like, oh, we will, you know, we will have uh, the ability to manipulate matter at like blah, you know, blah level, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, scale. But um, 
if you try to dig in and then you're like, and here's what it's like to wake up in the future, you know, and, and then, you know, the, you're eating the, or whatever, and it's just, you're wrong immediately. That, that's not how it's going to be. Um, and so you don't have the, um, the ability to really hone in on concrete details that are actually true. Um, and so in some sense, you need to, there's this like back and forth where you need to sort of imagine a concrete thing and then be like, okay, that's wrong, but there will then take the flavor of concreteness that you got from that and say, but it will be a concrete thing. It just won't be the specific one I imagined. Um, and then keep that flavor of concreteness even as you talk in more abstract ways. And that's, I think, a, a delicate dance. Yeah, yeah. As many viewers will know, Peter Thiel has this like very uh, talking point that he often brings up about uh, our uh, that we become indefinite optimists, um, and that he prefers a sort of definite optimism where you have a concrete vision of what the future could be. Um, um, okay, so yeah, uh, I guess to close out, what, what one of the things I wanted to ask you about was. Uh, so you said this was a side project, this blog. Um, I thought it was one of the, actually, uh, before you mentioned that your, the one of your main work is AI, I thought this was at least part of your main work. And so it's surprising. It's really surprising to me then that, uh, yeah, you're able to keep up the regularity. It's like, basically you're publishing a small book every, I don't know, every week or so. And, um, uh, filled with a lot of insight and the, the, I mean, it's like, well, so, uh, Unlike many other blogs on the internet, we're just plain style. Um, yeah, you, you've got like great prose. Uh, how are like what is your? Uh, how are you able to like maintain such uh, productivity on your side project? I should say a few of a few of my recent my most recent posts, which were especially long. Um, I was I had taken taken some time off from work and I and I was working on those partly in, the, in an academic context. Um, but the first the first year and a half or so of the blog was just on the side, and I've gone back to having it be on the side now. I, I think one thing that helps is my blog posts are too long, um, and, <laughs> uh, and so there's you know I have dreams of of writing these you know taking my long blog posts and then really crunching them down and making it into this like pithy, elegant uh, statement that that's really concise and, and condensed. Um, but uh, that would be more. So, you know, one, one way I sort of uh, increase my output is by not doing that uh, editing. And I feel I feel bad about that. Um, but that's one <laughs> that's one thing, at least. Um, uh, yeah, well, what is that quote where I, I don't know if somebody's asked, like, uh, how did you? I think it's something like I would have, you know, I would have written you a long letter, but I, or I would have, I didn't have time to write you a short letter. So I wrote you a long letter or something like that. Yeah, yeah uh, exactly. I, I, I have a friend who says, like, the actual thing it should be, I didn't have time to write you a short letter. So I wrote you a bad letter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I'm like, oh, I hope it's not that bad. Um, but I do, you know. I do think uh, if I had more time for these posts, I would I would try to kind of cut them down, and that's so that's one time saving, um, you know, for better or worse. Um, yeah, at least as a reader, uh, it often seems to me that the people like you who write. Um, I, maybe this is to describe uh, your process, but um, it, it was Scott Alexander says he kind of just writes stream of consciousness and that, that you know, it, it just turns out to be really readable. Your blog posts are really readable. Um, and even like the stuff I write, like the things that I write are that are, I, I'm like consciously not trying to make edits while I'm going on. They end up reading much better than the ones where I'm trying to optimize each sentence uh, and then taking two steps back for every one I take forward. Um, I've, I, I, I don't know if it's just, it could just be like a selection effect of the, the, the things that are harder to convey, you're spending more time editing, but, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder, I mean, my, my feeling is that my writing is, is quite a bit better if I have a chance to edit it. Um, and it's just, it's just a time thing. Um, but I do think people vary quite a bit and, and, you know, it's interesting. I, I don't know if I was recently reading this book. Um, George Saunders, who I think is a writer I really admire, has this uh, book about fiction writing called uh, Swim in the Pond in the Rain. Um, and the vibe uh, he tries to convey, and I think this is relatively common amongst writer types, is like this obsessive focus on, you know, even at a sentence by sentence level, really thinking about what, where is the reader's mind right now? How are they engaging? Are they interested? Are they surprised? Am I losing them? Um, and, and, you know, his writing is really, really engaging in ways that it's like not even obvious. You're, you just sort of start reading along and you're like, oh, wow, I'm really into this. Um, but it's also quite a daunting picture of the level of attentiveness required. And it's like, wow, if I'm going to write everything like that, it's like that's going to cut down a lot on my um, kind of overall output. Uh, and so I do think there's a balance there. And, and um, you know, to the extent you're, you're one of these people who you can just like stream of consciousness and that's like close to what you would get out of, out of editing, which I'm not sure I am, um, you know, all the better. It's sort of like you're lucky. Yeah, there's also an additional consideration where if you think there's going to be some kind of power law to like 
how much, how interesting a piece is or how, how many, um, how many people see it and how many people uh, find value in it, then it's not clear whether that uh, advises you to spend so much time on each piece to increase the odds that that one piece is going to blow up, given that there's a big difference between the pieces that blow up and don't, or whether you should just like do a whole bunch and then uh, kind of just try to sample uh, as, as often as possible. Yeah. And I think, I think actually that the blog, I started the blog partly as an exercise in just getting stuff out there. I think I had had, uh, I had had the idea that I would one day write up a bunch of stuff that I've been thinking about, but you know, it was somehow a, uh, and I would write it up in this grand, you know, I would finally write it up and it'd be this beautiful thing. And I would, you know, take all this time. And, and then, um, I had ended up, you know, for various reasons, feeling like I was approaching some aspects of my life with too much perfectionism or too much. And I needed to just like, um, get stuff out there faster. And so the blog was an exercise in, in in that, and I think has, uh, you know, I think that's paid off in ways, and that I don't know, I don't think I would have done it otherwise. I see. All right. Final question. Um, I, I'm curious if you have uh, three uh, book recommendations that you can give the audience. Probably my primary recommendation, that this is somewhat self-serving because I helped with this this project, is the book The Precipice by Toby Ord. Um, I, you know, may, may be familiar to many many of your listeners, but um, you know, I think it's uh, it's a book that really uh, conveys the ideas that matter, you know, most to me or that, that have had, you know, close to the biggest impact in, in my own life. Um, uh, other books, I, I love the play Angels in America. Um, I think it's just, a, I, I think it's a, a epic and amazing. Um, and, you know, that's not quite a book, but um, you, know, you can read it. Uh, I actually recommend watching the HBO miniseries, um, but uh, that's, you know, that's something I recommend. Um, and then uh, I don't know. Uh, last last year, I read I read this book, Housekeeping, by um, by Marilyn Robinson, and and uh, it had this sort of numinous uh, quality that um, I think a lot of her writing does. Um, and so I really like that and recommend it to people. That's also a piece of fiction. If you're looking for philosophy, I don't know. A lot of my work is is in dialogue with Nick Bostrom um, and uh, and his uh, yeah his his overall kind of corpus, and I think that's really really valuable to engage with. I see. Cool, cool. All right. Uh, yeah, Joe, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. This is a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Yeah, thanks for having me. Oh, I'll also say, you know, everything I've said here is just purely my personal opinion. Um, does, you know, not speaking for my employer, not speaking for, you know, uh, anyone else, just just myself. So just, just keeping that in mind. Cool, cool. Um, and then where can uh, people find uh, your stuff? So just uh, if you want to go over your blog link and then your Twitter link and uh, other things. Yep. So my blog is handsandcities.com. Um, and my Twitter handle is JK Carl Smith. Um, those are, those are good places to reach me. And then my personal website is josephcarlsmith.com. Okay. And then we're we'll going to find yourself on AI, uh, and those kinds of things. The stuff on AI is linked from my personal website. So that's the best, that's the best place to go. All right. Cool. Cool. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, and you want to support the podcast, the most helpful thing you can do is share it on social media and with your friends. Other than that, please like and subscribe on YouTube and leave good reviews on podcast platforms. Cheers. I'll see you next time.